Welcome back, dancers and parents. We have a very special episode today on Beyond the Point. We have dance nutritionist Rachel Fine joining us from To The Point Nutrition, and I am so excited for the information on this episode. No matter what your relationship with food is, this is a must hear for dancers and parents. Now, I have to apologize in advance for the sound on this one. We had some technical issues, and Rachel and I discussed whether to re-record it, but the information is so good, we didn't want to risk not saying it. So tune in, listen up, and next time we have her on, we will make sure that the sound is dynamite. Now, some of the things that we're covering in this episode are everything from what body dysmorphic disorder is, how she thinks about food for dancers, how she recommends balancing carbs and fats, tips and tricks on eating, um, and all of her free information available to you at any time. I am so excited, guys. So let's dive right in. Okay, guys, we have Rachel here with us. I'm so excited to have her on the podcast. She is a nutritionist who works with dancers almost exclusively, right, Rachel? Yeah, I would say by now... In the, I would say, like, in the past year, I've really narrowed it down to the ability where I can just see dancers exclusively. So I would say, like, 98% of my clientele are dancers. That's awesome. Yay, I'm so excited to have you on here. So, Rachel, instead of me introducing you, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got where you are today. Yeah. Uh, So I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I, let's see, I started my company, which is called To The Point Nutrition. I started it about six years ago already. Um, It was actually before I even got my license to be a dietitian. I was was in the clinical world. I was uh, working in a hospital, or I was doing my, like, clinical rotations in a hospital, about to actually start a job as a clinical dietitian, which I, I'm a science nerd, so I uh, very much wanted to be in the clinical world, working with, like, critical care patients, doing all the, uh, even, like, two feet type things. Um, I, I'm pretty nerdy. Uh, so I was doing that, but always in the back of my mind. I, I never stopped dancing. So just to even rewind more than that, six years before that, I was about 19. I made the transition from being full-time pre-professional dance student to wanting to really round out just my, my life, my lifestyle in general. And that's when I ended up doing a career switch into the nutrition world. But dance is always just such a huge part of my life. And I I can never, I I always say that dance is my psychologist, like going to a ballet class is my psychologist. Mm -hmm. So I never ended up, I never stopped dancing. I always continued dance even when I went um, and started school at NYU in Manhattan. And um, so that was to, in order to be a dietitian, it's a pretty rigorous process. It's about all in maybe six years. Wow. Um, and again, through that, I, I was still dancing. And like I said, it's such a big part of my life that um, I always knew that I wanted to work with dancers. I always knew that I wanted to be a dietitian for dancers because there just really weren't any out there. Yeah. It was uh, so, and we, we've spoken about this before, Allie. I mean, the amount of resources that are out there for me when I was, uh, and we can get into this a little bit later, but when I was struggling with disordered eating as a dancer, I had limited resources. And that's eventually why I went into nutrition because I I really developed a passion for it. But I wanted to help the girls that were just like me. And, um, you know, that, that classic type A perfectionist, uh, excuse me if I say bunhead type mm-hmm. of girl. I mean, that was me. And I always, I, I see them all over the place. And uh, so I wanted to really start my business for them, for those girls, for myself when I was in those shoes as well. Um, so, you know, six years after school, I was in the clinical world working in a hospital, but also wanting to work with dancers. So that's when I started my business. I actually believe I started the business like a week before I took the licensure test. I love that. Uh, So I, but, but the whole to the point nutrition thing was just on the, on the, um, back burner. I, I saw probably one client a week at the time max while I was working at the hospital full time. So I would do that and I would see like one client on, um, on the weekend or something. Uh, and then about like, 
within just about two years, I got typical me, uh, typical, again, type A perfectionist. I loved clinical nutrition so much that I burnt myself out with it. I got burnt out and I was like, well, I need to get back into a dance class. I need to, I need to drop what I'm doing and get back into a dance class because I was like going nuts. Uh, so I left the hospital, really took a plunge, left the hospital, decided to just dive into my private practice full time at that from, from the start, which was honestly really tough. Um, I ended up picking up some other things here and there. I did some research over at the Harkness Center for Dance Injuries mm-hmm. during this time. Uh, and I worked as a um, adjunct, clinical adjunct professor at NYU. So I was doing like still kind of keeping my foot in the clinical nutrition world, um, but really wanting to get back into the dance world and develop my practice. So that's uh, when I started that. I started, I was able to dance more, um, perform just a little bit, but nothing, nothing crazy. And that's when I just really developed to the point nutrition, which is, you know, fast forward about like four more years. And that's where I am today, which is um, I would say 90% of virtual practice. I am based in New York and I do have an office in New York. So sometimes I will see some clients who are here out on Long Island or in the city. Um, but m- much of the work that I do is virtual. Um, and back in January or February, I created an online course, Nutrition for Dancers. And just since then, I've been creating resources that dancers can really just have easier access to um, from all over the world. That's amazing. And that's kind of where we met each other was on the online world. um, As we both realized that our online courses um, kind of complemented each other in that we wanted our resources to be able to be reached, not just with our local people around us. Yeah. Um, so Rachel's courses are amazing or her course that she has. And it's really such a refreshing and healthy way to look at not just a dancer's body, anyone's body, but especially for somebody who is standing there, spending their day in front of the mirror comparing themselves constantly to other people's bodies. I know that I personally experienced this and I watch my dancers do it. Even when they come in here, they're eating their snack and they're looking at what someone else is eating. And they're, I can see their wheels turning, wondering if they've made a good choice or if that person looks a different way than they do, what their decision, what would their decision lead them to? So this comparison game is strong in the dance world and uh, your course has just offered so much healthful thinking about how to think about what you yourself are putting into your body, which is lovely, just lovely. So um, as you've gone towards doing your online stuff, what type of dancers has that kind of opened you up to? Uh, do you work with a certain level of dancers or do you get to see a wide variety? What, what's your normal clientele like? So I would say it's pretty 50-50 between the younger student dancers. So whether that be like those that are in pre-professional type programs. So Mm -hmm. a lot of them happen to be homeschooled. They're in programs that are, you know, they're dancing up to 30 hours a week. Right. So these girls, most of these students. Um, And then I'd say the other 50% are professionals. Uh, Most often I would say that uh, the students are the ones that really actually need more work. More, mm. uh, w- our relationships are built really, uh, we're built, we're working together for a longer period of time is what I'm saying because, uh, you know, as you know, the competitive environment of dance, just like what you were just saying before about the food is so strong and um, dancer, young dancers, have a lot to do. They've got a lot to accomplish to reach their goal. There's yes, a lot of they do. That needs to be done, and sometimes that mentality uh, puts us in a, a tunnel vision. And this is kind of what you're talking about before with snaps, like looking to the other girl. What does she have? What does she have? What is she doing? Um, and I so often I find that dancers are using food solely for the purpose of either like performance or reaching a certain weight Mm -hmm. Um, and which is which is important like we're much much of the work that I do with my clients 
focuses on performance nutrition, you know, balancing out our meals, choosing foods that are really going to optimize our performance. But there is also a major part of dance nutrition that often falls to the waistline, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and that's the idea of, and this kind of, what you said before kind of, kind of reminded me of this, but it's the idea of satisfaction. Most dancers are perfectionists, so they take the idea of wanting to improve performance and they and they take that to 150 percent yes okay, so definitely everything they eat has to be for the purpose of optimizing performance again that's a huge part of what i do we want to balance out our meals we want to choose foods that really are going to help our performance are that are going to build muscle um and and promote an overall uh performance goals, but what we're trying to achieve, which, as you know, endurance and strength-wise are pretty darn demanding uh, in the dance world. And what falls to the waistline is satisfaction and the idea that not everything we have to eat has to be for the purpose of performance and or a body weight goal. You know, we can eat something simply because it tastes good, because Mm -hmm. we like it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's keeping a healthy mindset also. Yeah. Yeah, and I find that with, again, just maybe this is just the clientele that I work with, but uh, dancers just are at risk to that perfectionism and and that type A personality. I don't know if they're necessarily at risk to that or they come in, you know, what what happened first, chicken or the egg. Right. Uh, but But it does really come to play the work that I do in terms of just helping these dancers find a bit more comfort in the middle ground. You know, not it doesn't have to be all or none, black or white, zero mm-hmm. to 100. Yeah. Well, you, when you were saying that uh, you're looking at kind of the extremes of how they how they uh, put food into their body, I was thinking similarly, I get a lot of ballerinas specifically, or maybe just people who do one genre, but ballerinas specifically come in and think that they need to work in turnout a hundred percent of the time. And if they are not doing something with their belly button pulled in and their pelvis tucked under them, they're not training hard enough to be a dancer. But in reality, they need to be training the opposite side of their body, their opposite muscles to then improve that muscle group or that thing that we're looking to make better for ballet so it reminded me in kind of the nutrition world as you're saying that that although we definitely want to be really aware of what we're putting in our body and what serves me what serves you what serves dancer julia um there's also this other part that like you don't need that performance side maybe 100 percent of the time but you do need the mental satisfaction or a carbohydrate every once in a while. And I think that we've fallen kind of far away from that in some extreme um, training, probably from our teachers' teachers. You know, things get passed down, and uh, I'm sure you have something to say about this, but I've definitely heard carbs can be the devil, and I don't think that they are. So um, that kind of thinking of being so extreme leads to very extreme behaviors. And um, most of the time leads to injury in my world. And I think it leads to a nutrition injury in yours. I mean, 100%. Our, our world's injuries are very similar. Yes, they are. The nutrition injuries at the end of the day are, um, well, there, there's obviously many, but what I'm going to focus on are the bone-related injuries. Because mm-hmm. when a dancer is really not fueling sufficiently, uh, they risk a host of reactions in the science world, we call this relative energy deficiency in sport. And essentially what that means is that they're not providing their body with enough calories to support the high demands Uh of their exercise. So what's happening is that the body is prioritizing and say, okay, well, it's saying, sorry, um, I got to get through this dance class. We got to push through. So I'm going to I'm going to shut down other processes that aren't really needed for my individual survival. So what does it say? Like we don't really need reproduction for our individual survival as a species we do, but not as an individual. So the body says, well, you know what, let's, let's mute our reproductive system for a second. uh, So we can push through this, this dance class. So we can push through these performances because we have enough energy to do that. Uh, But we don't have enough energy for both the metabolic end and for the physical end. Mm-hmm. So in doing so, what happens? Uh, hormone, hormonal imbalances uh, ensue, and obviously, I'm just really generalizing it right now for right. the sake of 
the purpose of your podcast. But um, what happens is hormonal imbalances, and then long story short, what happens is what happens after, from that are uh, de- deterioration of bone, and mm-hmm. then what happens when we dance on weak bones? We're at risk for stress fractures. We're at risk for bone-related injuries. So it really is um, the nutrition for performance end of things is so important. And then what I often like to tell my clients is that not only are we strengthening, not only are we using nutrition to give our body the tools to build the muscles that you, Ali, are working with them on to build, right? But we also have to remember the mental muscle, strengthening the mental muscle because there's nothing – more um there's there's nothing in my opinion that's sadder than a dancer who leads to burnout who leads to mental burnout um, right from just from really under fueling because at the end of the day an under fueled dancer is tired right they're mm-hmm. weak they're fatigued and again another reason for why the risk of injury is so prominent with um just under fueling and lack of nutrition yeah absolutely Um, I want to jump back a little bit. I want to ask you what your feeling is on dancers as you were talking about, you know, the, the injury of eating and the hormones being out of whack and taking your, um, taking the energy from one system into another or leaving something behind. I have a feeling that, um, our reproductive system is something that gets left behind frequently because that seems like that's not high on the priority list of a day-to-day activity, like you said. So I know I have a lot of dancers whose parents ask me about their um, periods and all of that stuff, right? So sorry if you're a guy listening to this, but it's an important thing. And I get asked all the time, is it okay that they don't have this? Is it okay that it's light or sparse? Or what can we do to make sure that this is happening and this is a hundred percent i want to say everyone this is individual and this is where working with someone is very important one-on-one but rachel what's your general feeling about when you get somebody who's in their teen years who's so burnt out on food who's not maybe giving themselves all the different components to help their health and this is a sign that that could be happening I get this question all the time. Um, parents, whether it's coming from the parents or it's coming from the dancers, I often hear, and actually the scary thing is that I've heard this from medical professionals too, and it, it gets under my skin. Um, I've heard them say, oh, but it's common for dancers to not get their period. Yes. And I cannot stress this enough, but just because something is common doesn't make it normal. Absolutely. Okay? And, and so, so when I work with dancers, one of the first things that I tell them is that our goal together may not necessarily be to reach a certain number on the scale, okay? Mm-hmm. Rather, I want to reach a weight that you can sustain a period at. And that's often what we work Mm, towards. Interesting. Um, Now, this might sound scary to a dancer who's scared to gain five pounds. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's and I and I actually just wrote an article about um, the reality of the dance world. I mean, there are companies out there that have requirements, um, and they are often unhealthy requirements. They are often unrealistic requirements, and you know, the idea of changing the industry is a, a podcast in of itself. Absolutely. Right? Um, but for the individual, I I really encourage that one does work to find a, a balance, a balanced lifestyle that does promote getting a period. Because in what I say is that a period is a great symptom of good health. Yeah. Okay. Get it. So when you said, sorry, if you're a guy listening, actually men are also, or boys are Mm -hmm. also just as much at risk for developing what I call, what I said before, relative energy deficiency in sport. Uh And actually in the past, Ali, I don't know if you remember this term, it used to be called the female athlete triad. Yes. Yes. And, And the reason for that was because the biggest symptom of poor bone health is not getting a period. It's the easiest. Mm. It's the easiest symptom to um, to spot. But over time, they realize that boys and men as well 
were showing very low hormone levels and at risk for the same bone related injuries. So it's even harder to identify in men because they don't get a period. Ah. Whereas, whereas in females, if you're not getting a period, this is a symptom that you could be putting your body at risk for bone related injuries. And one thing I do want to point out is that this is not always the case for someone with disordered eating behaviors. Some dancers will come to me and they're eating, they're eating four to five times a day. Their meals are balanced, but they don't realize that they're dancing 20 to 30 hours a week. They just got to bump it up a little bit. And I also want to say that sometimes we forget about fat. We forget about, because fat's a scary word in our culture. Mm -hmm. Like no matter how, unfortunately, unfortunately, we, our culture has demonized fat. And luckily there's a lot of movements happening right now that are really trying to change this. Um, there's healthy at every size. There's a lot, there's body positive. A lot of great movements are happening. Um, but it is unfortunate that fat is such a fear word, whether it's on our body or it's in our food. And I often tell my clients that fat in our food, especially unsaturated healthy fats are like liquid gold to a dancer's body Mm -hmm. because they're providing so many nutritional benefits. Like they're, they're anti-inflammatory and I'm sure, you know, but you know, when exercise in general is putting stress on the body, it's a form of stress. And when the body is under any level of stress, there's going to be some level of inflammation and inflammatory response happening on the inside. So healthy fats really like olive oil, avocados, uh, nuts, seeds, these, uh, these sources, um, these are great sources for phytonutrients, antioxidants, um, omega-3 fatty acids that really do play an anti-inflammatory role. And I really encourage my dancers, because not only do they do that, but they do help with hormone regulation. Yeah. Fat, adding fat to a meal really helps with hormone regulation. But I think, again, the word fat gets just very much gets demonized in our culture that a lot of dancers will uh, automatically try to avoid it. And the, bis- the biggest example I can always say is Halo Top. Halo Top ice cream is probably, I, I, I would say like 99% of the dancers that come see me, the first thing on their 24 hour recall is like Halo Top. Really? And I'm, I, and I mean, I could go on and on about the, um, the, the, the properties of fat and just even just the satisfaction factor of, of adding fat to meals, you know, having one scoop of just regular ice cream as opposed to an entire pint of Halo Top ice cream. Yeah. Rather than have the one scoop, the one simple scoop of ice cream. Does that yep. Make sense? It absolutely makes sense. It absolutely <laughs> does. Because it's all, it's all about balance. And I think that that's what you're promoting and what you're seeing results with is it appears when I follow your Instagram and when I see your emails and everything, it's I one of, I, you just posted one that I loved. I mean, I love them all, but you, she did, Rachel does a great job of posting things that instead of saying like, you should eat this instead of this, it's like, well, if you ate this and this together, it's going to give you more energy. It's going to last you through. You're assisting the carbs and the fat and the proteins to work together. So I saw instead of a pretzel, why don't you eat pretzel and hummus? And I was like, I love hummus. Thank you for giving me permission to eat pretzels and hummus together. Thank you. So funny that you say that. I just have to get you up because I'm starting to get these, like I'll get DMs in my inbox or even just people that I know, like from, from home. Yeah. Who'd be like, you know, Rachel, I had a slice of pizza for dinner last night and it was really satisfying. And I just want to thank you because you, because of you, I know it's okay. Yeah. And like, that makes me so happy because that's the point. I just did a post the other day that I was like, oh, you know what? I like this one. I'm going to have to do more of these where it was like what they think dancers eat, what dancers actually eat. You know what I mean? Because it, we, we really get into these restrictive mindsets. And again, when you're a type A, when you're a perfectionist, it's very difficult to see out of that, to see out of the those rules that we yeah. implement on ourselves. Um, and, and again, it's so funny because when you realize, when you eventually give yourself permission to enjoy that food, even if it's a more quote unquote indulgent food, like let's say a slice of pizza, you realize like you take pizza off its pedestal. It's not as important anymore. You can have pizza anytime, any day. So you're going to have it. 
you know, you're going to enjoy it and then you're going to move on. It's not like this, when we avoid things like the halo top versus the regular ice cream, um, where it's constantly in the back of our head. Oh my God, I can't wait to have my pint of halo top. I can't wait to have it. I can't wait to have it. I can't wait to have it. When you would just feel more satisfied if you ended up just having the real deal to begin with. Yeah. You know, this is something that it's taken me 30 years to learn and I'm still learning it. But I do have to say to everyone that's listening, this is really because of some of the things that I have learned from Rachel's emails and her course. So I've done the diet yo-yo as a dancer. I've done it as a post dancer when I stopped dancing and my body changed. I was injured and couldn't move. So my body changed. And the hormones play a big role, and I realize that as I've gotten my personalized help. But I've, in the last few years, done the eating change where I don't do one thing. I don't do carbs. I don't do this. And it was successful for a short amount of time, but my health, not the way I looked, but my health went down. I started losing hair more than normal. My skin didn't look good. My energy level wasn't good. And I started to realize this is not sustainable. So then fast forward, and now after months of working with Rachel and doing some of her tips and tricks, I really do look at my eating more as what's going to help my body right now. What do I need in this moment? And the other day it was National Ice Cream Day, which I'm not a, like, if society tells you you should eat this food today, you should go eat it. But I happen to love ice cream and I have friends who love ice cream. And I was like, guys, let's go get a scoop of ice cream. And we did. I got my one scoop. I felt totally great about it. And then I next day got back to my eating that made me feel good. And it was satisfying and I don't feel bad about it. And I'm here I am feeling better. And I it didn't have to make or break my body because of that one scoop of ice cream. Knowing that those experiences won't make or break you is huge. I think that many, many times we forget, you know, we're so focused on, on food for our performance that we forget that food can actually be an experience, mm-hmm. that it can actually be an enjoyable experience, a pleasurable experience. And this is something that I, myself personally, only started to really um, hit home with me just in the past few years because of my son who now is two and a half and I watch him and it is so fascinating to learn from a toddler yeah right? because toddlers and I and I tell my clients this just because it, it really is so eye-opening um even though my not my clients can't really relate they're like 14 to right 14 years old. but you have to realize that a toddler just everything with instincts okay they're they're craving this they eat this they eat half they put it down they're done they go play yeah they want more they go back it's like it's not so much thought it's not they don't they don't have all those external factors saying like well are the muffins uh, made with yogurt are they right are they fattening are they sugary whatever and it, it's not having that like all of that chatter and all of that restraint talking to you there's something that's so freeing about it, and it really brings in what I what I learned even just from watching him is that like food is supposed to be a pleasurable experience. And this was another article that I recently wrote about emotional eating because emotional eating we often think about like oh emotional eating's not good. You're sitting in front of your TV screen. You're eating a pint of ice cream. Blah blah blah. But the truth is, food can be emotional. You know. Again, it's about bringing that positive experience of eating back again, because so often as dancers wanting to just use food as a tool for performance, we forget about that. We forget about the um, the positive experiences that one can have, even from a more indulgent type food. Mm-hmm. So as you are talking about your toddler, this really reminds me that I actually have several clients who are seeing me regularly who are... 13 to 17 years old, who just haven't had the exposure to different types of food. And they are adamant that they, quote, do not like certain foods. And when I question them farther, they've never had them. So with some of them, it's become a personal mission because I I want them to experience these things. They eat a bite of my lunch every time. And they look at me like, that's a green smoothie. And I'm like, well, it's great. Taste it. Mm -hmm. 
But what I'm getting at when you said the toddler thing is that I know I've heard that toddlers or that kids need to taste things. I don't know if I'm quoting the right number, but maybe 12 to 20 times before their taste buds start to develop about what they like or don't like. And for kids or dancers, because I feel like we as a dance culture have restricted our food so much that maybe at a young age, these dancers are hearing that they shouldn't eat certain foods. So they don't, or they just fall on the extreme, maybe where they're counting calories and they're not thinking about, um, making sure they're balanced. So they're really leaving out a wide variety of food. And then when they come to me and we start talking about if they've had a Brussels sprout or quinoa or something like that, or even brown rice, they they think they don't like it. Do you have any advice on that? Do you experience in that? Is, what's your come from when you're trying to introduce new foods that maybe seem a little bit scary because you've you haven't done it before? I think it's a really good topic. Um, you know, it's so funny. Most of the girls that see me, um, usually those scary foods are not necessarily like Brussels sprouts and quinoa. It's more like pizza and ice cream Mm -hmm. and those are more the scary foods that I hear about Um, but I do a lot of work with with my clients Um, I call it exposure work uh, because and this is from cognitive behavioral theory or sorry therapy which is on the psych end of things Mm -hmm. and I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, but I do have some experience in CBT and this use of exposure work does help to get these dancers trying more, breaking their boundaries from foods that are more feared. Um, Again, what I see more often, though, is like the fear of cooking with oil. Yeah. Like having sauteed veggies instead of having steamed veggies. Um, So those are more the food fears that I work with. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's an, I call them unapologetic enjoyments. So I'll have my dancers like write a list of foods that they feel are bad or maybe or maybe they read that they're bad maybe someone has told them that they're bad um and i have them write them down and slowly as we're working together we reintroduce these foods back into their daily meal plan or a weekly meal plan you know however it's i really i always try and meet my clients halfway in terms of um work working when they're comfortable doing this yeah Um, but it's but it's called exposure work, and it's definitely pushing their limits, which can be really tough because the dancers who are that young, especially the ballet dancers who are right now maybe not quite as exposed to um, more of the contemporary type work, more of the improv or mm-hmm. modern type of work, so yeah. they're very much learning in the framework of, of classical technique, right? So the idea of of letting go that and this this is actually very personal for me because this was one of the biggest things I struggled with when I like uh quote unquote graduated from uh being like that young dance who only did classical technique to to really dipping my feet into worlds of contemporary dance and modern dance and letting go (laughs) you know what I mean dropping dropping letting go being heavy to the floor and Mm -hmm. things like that um, and do you, do you see dancers like that where it's like, it's tough for them to do that? Yeah, like, absolutely. Ballerinas? Yes. They, I have some great ballet schools right here and they, there's a level of uncomfort that just inherently comes yeah, you know, with they're doing so that. They're comfortable in their classical technique, you know, holding themselves, holding their arms, so uh, port de bras, all of that. Um, that it's very similar with the food thing, right? We, we get comfortable. We get comfortable mm-hmm. with what we know. Yeah. Um, and we get comfortable with a framework, with a specific framework that we set out for ourselves. And at some point, we have to learn to push those limits. We have to learn to to push ourselves to try new things, whether that new thing is something like a, a quote unquote healthy food like quinoa, or whether that new thing is something that they ate when they were toddlers but stopped eating because they learned it was unhealthy, like a slice of pizza or an ice cream sundae. So, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So something that you keep saying that I really like is you say disordered eating. And I feel like that applies to a lot of areas, not just what you, it sounds like you've kind of made a play on eating disorder. 
but that has a very specific connotation in my mind. Tell us a little bit about what you mean by disordered eating. Well, I, you know, as I really had my practice over the past several years, I realized that most of the dancers that are coming to see me are coming to me with such strong uh, I quote unquote knowledge. Okay. About the dieting, dieting, nutrition, and health, because there's, they're getting all of this information from what's called diet culture. You go on Google, you learn about whatever, whatever type of diet, bad type that is out there. So most of the dancers that see me have never officially been diagnosed with an eating disorder and, and, and eating disorders is a very specific uh, term uh, that's defined uh, in, in the medical community. And yeah. there's multiple types of eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, uh, bulimia, and those are just two, but there are many different types. And I found that most of the girls that I was working with fall more under the umbrella of orthorexia, which is actually not yet an official di- diagnosis of an eating disorder. Maybe one day it will be, but it's very hard to give it such a black and white diagnosis because because orthorexia is the obsession with healthy eating. Mm. And that that's that's really what I, I, I based my practice on because that's what I personally struggled with when I was making that transition between dance and, and nutrition was like my type A perfectionist mentality was like, oh my God, I, I wanna I wanna perfect my performance. So I have to perfect my diet. I have to follow a perfect diet. I'm going to, I'm not going to restrict calories. I love calories. I love food. I love healthy foods and eating and making these different recipes and blah, blah, blah. But it, it leaves no room for error. Uh-huh. error I'm sorry. Uh, it leaves no room for that slice of pizza because I have to eat whole foods. I have to eat minimally processed foods. And again, the reason why it's so difficult to uh, set a diagnosis for this is because how do we how do we define when this is unhealthy behavior and when it's not unhealthy behavior in the sense that you know they're eating these girls are eating and they're eating really great healthy foods their their body is is getting the fuel it needs but as i started working more with the with these populations i realized that maybe the physical end of things is okay maybe this is sustaining the physical end of things but it is tormenting the emotional and the mental end of yeah. things. And that's where it needs to burn out. Yeah. Okay. So, um, your, so your original question about disorder eating. So that's when I was like, you know, most of these clients aren't coming to me with anorexia nervosa or bulimia, or I'm not seeing these clinically defined eating disorders in my population, but I am seeing a very deep, uh, sense of disordered eating. You know, their eating is messed up. Their relationship with food is is messed up because there's no room for error. And when error does happen, because eventually it always does, we do lead ourselves on right. again, all or nothing mentality. Um, it's like the end of the world. And that could be very detrimental to to a dancer who you know, who feels that they have to bring their food to social events or who feels that they can't even go to social events because they're scared. That's very true. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. They're scared that they're uh, not going to have anything to eat. That is really has been quote unquote approved for their, um, in, in, for their clean, I like to say their clean diet or just their perfect diet. Mm -hmm. So what about people who come to you with, I, I bet this falls into that same category you're talking about, but um, I feel like there's some of my clients and people I've worked with, and I'm even thinking of myself, after I stopped dancing, I didn't realize that food affected me so extremely because I wasn't anorexic and I wasn't bulimic mm-hmm. and I wasn't a toothpick. I wasn't a, you know, I don't think anyone was worried that I fell into that category, But it wasn't until I stopped dancing that I realized I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. I realized that I looked in the mirror a lot and was thinking about what needed to change and what I was going to do long term, I guess, or maybe not even long term. But what was I going to do about my eating that day to help me with that, quote, extra roll of fat or whatever it was. And I realized that looking at some of my other friends who didn't dance, they didn't quite look at themselves that way. Not that they don't have their own body stuff. We all do. 
But I now see that with a lot of clients that they maybe do or don't have a very well-rounded eating, but I see them come in and start working out. And the way that they look at themselves in the mirror is uh, very detrimental from my, from my standpoint. So when you get people who are coming into you and are, you can tell that they are, I don't even know what the word is looking negatively at themselves or they're, yeah. So (laughs) where, where does this fall in with your people or how you, how you're seeing it, how you're treating it? What, what does this work look like to you? I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but um, I literally, I just wrote an article about this because it, again, hits home so well to me. Yeah. But it's called body dysmorphia. Uh-huh. That's the more, like, official term for yeah. it. But, like, the lesser official, I call situation of this whole thing, is body dissatisfaction. There is just an overwhelming amount of body dissatisfaction going yeah, on. Yeah, there is. Um, not only in the dance community, but everywhere. And the unfortunate thing about all of this is that it's hard to not have body dissatisfaction because we literally live in a world that is telling us transformation Tuesday. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we, we should be working on transforming something. We should be working to achieve something that we're already not. Right. That's like the whole basis of our culture is like always striving to be whatever we're not right now. And like that, that I think that's the, the detrimental aspect of this. And one thing that, um, you know, kind of always hits home for me is that I am have always been um, a. I, I, I'm not someone I'm trying to think of the, like a correct way of saying this but I I am not someone who has ever been in a larger body like I've I've you would say I'm naturally on the thinner side I don't Mm -hmm. know the experience Mm -hmm. of being in a larger body and it is very unfortunate that our society does really have separate standards for what's acceptable and what's not acceptable it's it's truly unfortunate and the one thing I want to really just say out there is that body dysmorphia is still very prominent, even for those who perhaps live in bodies that are more socially acceptable. Absolutely. Um, so I'll often hear comments, you know, a, a client will come to me and their dance teacher will say, Oh, you look really good. Like whatever. And that is like that. Or they'll even tell me like a medical, like a, I, I once had a client come to me and, and she told me that her, um, I, I think it was her, uh, a, like a mental health counselor told her that she looked really good. And this client hadn't gotten a period for about like three years. Mm-hmm. And she, we were working together to get her to a healthier weight. But when she heard from a higher up, when she heard from more of a mentor that she looked good, it was like, wait, what? Like, but I look good. She told me I look good. You know, she, she's a mentor. She's older than me. She's an adult. And it's very, we have to be so careful when it comes to dancers and body weight. Um, even if a dancer looks healthy, okay. No matter how they look, they look quote unquote acceptable to a director it's so important that directors are very careful because they don't know how that dancer is getting to this weight yeah i have to whether it's natural whether it's um through healthy methods or not yeah i totally agree i have to watch myself because this is a this is a passionate subject for me i future podcast how many times i was told i have to lose five pounds (laughs) it's insane and um how many times I called my mother bawling because I thought I was doing well dancing. Yeah. I thought the directors were happy with me. And then turns out they pulled me aside and you, you know, you need to lose five pounds or else that's it, you're done. Yeah. Like you're not going to get anywhere. Um, but as a, as someone in that professional realm, like you're talking about where I'm working to see strength gain and body awareness, it's, I've realized how careful I have to be in what I say and how I say, because like you said, I don't know what's happening outside of my studio. And I really try really, really to use my spidey senses to sense what's, what's going on with these kids and these dancers. And it's easier when I see them each week, 
but a lot of them I I don't. And it's very easy to hide what's going on on the inside, um, especially if you know you have somebody who's looking for these things. So I... That's why this podcast and what you're doing is so great because you're you're really integrating the different fields that are yes. to sense out uh, these type of issues. Absolutely. So my question for you, where I'm going with this thought, is what can what can the parents do? Because I feel like a lot starts with the parents, and uh, it's going to be an ongoing thing. If I have to continuously think about how I'm saying something to dancers after being in it for 20 years. The parents are going to have to really think about it. And we're all going to make slips. We're all going to say things that we go, shoot, I shouldn't have said it that way. Um, But even just to each other, like these young dancers that are wanting to support their friends better, I think everybody knows if you're in the dance world, you've had some type of comment that has made you not feel good. It's made you feel less than, you walk away with a heavy heart or something like that. So you understand what it feels like. And if you see a friend or a coworker or a fellow dancer who's maybe having one of those moments where they've had something that a director has said, a teacher said, a parent said, affect them, what what do you say to maybe the parent side of this? Maybe this isn't something that you get to work with because if you're working with the kids, but um, do you have any advice for the parents or the friend in ways to talk about positive body changes or or not talk about them, I guess. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought this up. I do work with many of the dancers' parents as well. It's definitely, even though they're not always sitting in on the sessions, I'm, I'm usually always in, in contact with the parents. And um, actually back in August, I, as you know, uh, launched my dance resource site mm-hmm. that really has its own section for dance parents, you know, whether these parents are familiar with the dance world or whether they're not. Um, I offer up some, a great tip sheet in there that that they can download, but, and it's free by the way. Everyone should go download that. (laughs) My biggest, my biggest suggestion, my biggest tip is that parents have to look in a mirror and assess their own relationship with food because kids are going to model kids model behaviors Um, And parents had to, if their relationship with food and their body needs some repairing, then they too should should consider seeing a dietitian or a licensed professional because that doing this together as a family is, is really important. Um, it gets really tough when, when a parent really doesn't know the dance world. So they think like, Oh, but this is again, like what we said before, this is normal. This quote, is quote, normal. For normal. You know, yeah. You shouldn't be getting a period. It's normal. And this is why your resources, my resources are really just have to get out there and let them know that, you know, you can still be a professional dancer and have a very healthy, balanced lifestyle. You can still eat. You can have a slice of pizza and still be a professional dancer. Yep. And that's what we have to let them know. And sometimes this can be really hard because, you know, there are directors out there that are still living by old antiquated standards of body aesthetics. But sometimes we also have to ask ourselves, well, these five pounds that we're striving so hard to reach with restrictive behaviors, whether that's over-exercising or under eating, are those five pounds really worth it? Are those five pounds really what, what are going to make me pull out those 30, 32 foites perfectly? Like that's those five pounds are the reason why I'm not doing it now. And as you know, and this is something I always have to remind dancers is that muscle weighs more than fat. Yep. So we want musculature. We want strength. Yeah. Because that's the only way we're getting through. I mean, the demands of dance these days from when you and I were dancing are insane. And you can yeah. just scroll through Instagram and see what these girls are pulling out. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep, definitely. And the strength to do it. So I hope that answers your question about the parents, though. Yeah, absolutely. So, um... Rachel has some wonderful online resources. She has a lot of free information, which I really, really appreciate. Um, Rachel, tell us where we can find all of your stuff and kind of give us a rundown on what you have. Yeah. So uh, about back in August, I launched my newest resource. So I've been... That, so I, like I said earlier in the podcast, in February, I created an online course. Um, it's a six-week program, and it's helped a lot of dancers really build a framework for a balanced lifestyle and also for, for their performance. Now, 
then a couple months after that, I launched my first performance workbook, which is a downloadable guide. And that was specifically for summer intensives. And I really, the reason why I did that was because I wanted an even lesser expensive, more attainable option for dancers. So mm-hmm. that they, because I can't, I mean, you know this, but the amount of eating disorders that, that originate at summer intensives I mean that's like the breeding ground of, yep. of, of, I should say of disordered eating yeah um, our summer dance intensive so I was like before these girls go out on their intensives I've got to get them something so I made a performance workbook and then back in August I was like you know what I, I wanted to just make a bunch more resources that were really just free that dancers can turn to to find um, pretty much everything they need in regards to dancer health and dancer nutrition specifically. So that's when I launched it's dancenutrition.com and you can go on there. I have a bunch of free downloads, free downloadable guides, and I even created a free uh, mini course for dancers because one of the biggest questions that I get, and I love polling my followers. I don't know if you, you do this with your followers, but I'll, I'll poll them and I'll be like, you know, what's the most concerning thing to about nutrition or what do you find the most confusing? And time and time again, I hear a lot about just nutrients. Like what specific nutrients do I need as a dancer, whether it's calcium or vitamin D. So I made a little three day uh, free mini course that dancers can check out. And then in in turn, they can kind of see if they want some more guidance, they can turn to the other resources that I have. Wonderful. And your, um, on, well, your course for dancers, you do this virtually also, you said predominantly virtually. Yes. Yes. The course it's called the healthy dancer. And, uh, you can find that on my website point with an E (laughs) nutrition.com, or you can also find it at dance nutrition.com. And like I said before, it's a six week training program. Now there's two levels to it. You can either just do the straight up course, which involves video instruction and quizzes and assignments. And a lot, again, of these just interactive downloadable guides, Um, Or you can do, I have an elite program, which basically means you're getting the course, but then you're also meeting with me virtually for three sessions. So we, and actually when I hang up with with this podcast with you, I have uh, my course students that I'm going to be seeing for the rest of the afternoon. So uh, we'll meet for like three sessions while you're going through the, the modules of the course. That's great. Yeah. And I'm a huge proponent of one on one training. I, I still get one-on-one training in all regards, physical, emotional, and with my eating. So this is a great way if parents are looking for something to assist your child, if you're not sure where they kind of fall into this disordered eating, because I will say that it appears to me that most dancers have fall into the spectrum of what you're calling disordered eating. And if you're not sure how to assist your child or yourself, Rachel is really a great resource. And the reason that I had her on, because there are a lot of nutritionists in the world and a lot of them are wonderful, but I have definitely run into my share where I'm like, I don't think I would want you working with a dancer. So it's been wonderful to find her. And Rachel, you also work with people who aren't dancers. So like you were saying, if parents wanted to see that there's something inside of them that is shining through in their kid this could be something that you guys do together and even if you're not interested in that i would say go take a look at her free resources they're amazing she puts so much work into them and it really shows through um rachel tell us where we can find you on instagram and your website one more time yeah so i am updating on instagram pretty much daily uh, so you can find me at to the point nutrition and you all know points is obviously with an E. Duh. Uh, that, that's why I love working <laughs> with the dance community because I don't have to explain I why know. I spell point with an E. Yes. Uh, so that's my Instagram to the point nutrition. And, uh, my, I have two websites. My, my, uh, business website is pointnutrition.com. So that's where you'll learn all about my services and what I have to offer as a registered dietitian for dancers. And then my resource site, this is dancenutrition.com. And that's just more of a resource site where that's, um, I update blogs on there. I have several blogs that come up, that come out each month on there. Um, I, again, I have many free downloadable resources on there and I have a bunch of links to just the resources that I've encountered both as a dancer and as a dietitian that I would recommend you check out. So Wonderful. Those are the two two websites. 
Wonderful. And I'm going to put that stuff in our show link so you guys can find that below. Reach out to her with your questions. Make sure you follow her on Instagram. I've learned so much just from following her on Instagram and sign up for her emails. That would be wonderful. That was Rachel Fine. Isn't she wonderful? I wanted to let you know that on Friday, she will be taking over my Instagram to answer all of your questions after listening to this episode. So make sure that you tune in this Friday and ask her. She will also be doing a giveaway of her Nutcracker Performance Workbook to help you guys go into this crazy season and prepare. So make sure that you check it out on my Instagram, Align Fitness by Allie. She will be there. Second, it's been really fun to hear from you guys after last week's goal setting episode, and it puts a huge smile on my heart to hear that you can relate to the information on this podcast. So if you got any nuggets out of today's episode, take a screenshot of this episode, share it on your IG stories, put it in a text to a friend, or leave us a quick review by swiping up. You heard Rachel talk about how common some of these eating habits are and the issues that are in the dance world. Myself and Rachel are doing our very best to get this information out into the dance community, but the bottom line is that we need your help. We need your help to change the perception of the arts, what dancers should be eating to feel their bodies, what dancers do or don't do, that they are athletes, that dancers have silent grace that is really like a jungle cat, not a mouse. (laughs) So take 10 seconds to share in the way that you can. Send a text do something on social media, write a review, your friend will thank you for sharing your knowledge and not keeping it to yourself. To wrap things up today, I wanted to share my favorite thing from this week, which is actually from Rachel's Instagram. I wanted to say that I love the way she talks about better ways to combine food. Uh, Instead of just eating a pretzel, she says, eat a pretzel with peanut butter. Instead of uh, just a carrot, eat it with hummus, so on and so forth. It really has made me think more about what satisfies me in the moment instead so that I can be like present and strong and I'm not thinking about what my next snack is going to be because I really wasn't satisfied. I'm taking care of myself in the moment and it really is allowing me to be more present, do my thing, participate in my world and show up 100%. So that's it for this week. Have a wonderful week. I will see you next Wednesday on Beyond the Point.